Tibet. A land of mystery shrouded in a reality that all is not what it seems. High in the Himalayas, Tibet is a region in the central part of East Asia, covering much of the Tibetan plateau and spanning about 970,000 square miles. Tibet has some of the world's tallest mountains, with several of them making the top 10 list. Mount Everest, located on the border with Nepal, is at 29,032 feet, the highest mountain on Earth. Several major rivers have their source in the Tibetan Plateau. The Tibetan Plateau, while feeling desolate, it is rich in resources for mind, body, and spirit. Thoughts of Tibet bring a sense of tranquility. Yet underlying this tranquility is the reality of a land and people under turmoil. The native Tibetan people have strived to maintain their traditions, beliefs, and identity in an environment of persecution and suppression. The best part of my journey in Tibet came when I convinced the mandated tour guide to let me go on my own to explore the villages and meet the local Tibetan people. Through this exploration, I was able to enter otherwise restricted monasteries and have some incredible encounters. Tibet's Buddhist monasteries form a key part of the country's national identity. For Tibetans, they hold great religious and cultural significance, and, under the Chinese occupation, they have also become centers of political activism. Monasteries are centers of Tibetan resistance. Due to their respected status, Tibet's monks and nuns make natural community leaders. They run educational projects, orphanages, and old people's homes and help preserve Tibet's unique culture and language. It is in visiting these monasteries, I experience the spiritual and political nature of Tibet and its people. While visiting many monasteries on my own, I became keenly familiar of the sights, smells, and sounds that accompany Tibetan spirituality. Without the cackling of tourists and tour guides, I was able to become intimately involved in monastery life. One of the most enlightening experiences I had while in the monasteries was witnessing the daily education of young monks. In these settings, older monks would pose a spiritual question or riddle to the young monk. As the young monk provided an answer, the old monk would listen and without warning would clap his hands, stopping the young monk mid-sentence. The older monk would then pose another riddle. The clap reminded the young monk that there is no certainty in life. This process, riddle, clap, riddle, went on for hours. It was mesmerizing. It was in a monastery where I met a very young monk. His name is Norbu. He is short in stature and is hunched over. We had an amazing conversation where he shared his faith and we exchanged gifts. He showed me his private temple where we prayed together. He became my friend. As I explored the monasteries and villages, I met some amazing humble people. Each greeted me with a smile. I was invited into homes where we exchanged stories and laughter. Together we enjoyed meals and I was blessed with priceless gifts. Though the beauty and tranquility of Tibet is captivating, it is the Tibetan people that contain the spirit and soul of Tibet.
Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, is the seat of both government and Buddhist faith. It was and remains the home of the exiled Dalai Lama. The palace of the Dalai Lama is known as the Portola. It was his residence until he was exiled in the 1950s. Lhasa is a city of contrasts. Temples of faith and temples of sin, side by side, become a living example of the yin and yang of life. The Patola Palace is a fortress in Lhasa. It was the winter palace of the Dalai Lamas from 1649 to 1959, has been a museum since then, and a World Heritage Site since 1994. The palace is named after Mount Patalaka, the mythical abode of a Bodhisattva. The fifth Dalai Lama started its construction in 1645 after one of his spiritual advisors pointed out that the site was ideal as a seat of government. The building measures 1,300 feet east-west and 1,150 feet north-south, with sloping stone walls averaging 9.8 feet thick and 16 feet thick at the base, and with copper poured into the foundations to help proof it against earthquakes. Thirteen stories of buildings, containing over 1,000 rooms, 10,000 shrines, and about 200,000 statues, soar 384 feet on top of Marple Ree, the Red Hill rising more than 980 feet in total above the valley floor. The central part of this group of buildings rises in a vast quadrangular mass above its satellites to a great height, terminating in gilt canopies. This central member of Patola is called the Red Palace from its crimson color, which distinguishes it from the rest. It contains the principal halls and chapels and shrines of the Dalai Lama. In 1949, the Chinese government began to exert its dominance over Tibet. 1950 to 1959, the Chinese government ruled the area but allowed for Tibetan traditions to be maintained. In 1959, China's military crackdown led to the Lhasa Uprising. Full-scale resistance spread throughout Tibet. Fearing capture of the Dalai Lama, unarmed Tibetans surrounded his residence and the Dalai Lama escaped to India. Okay, let's go. Since the 1950s, the influence of Chinese dominance has changed Tibet, its landscapes, and cities. What was once a peaceful, tranquil center of Buddhism was transformed to a land of contrasts. I was able to go to a monastery in the day and attend a burlesque show in a cabaret below the Patola in the evening. Native Tibetans are not allowed in these cabarets, and I am not sure they would want to be there. But one can find numerous tourists and many Chinese soldiers. So there you have it, my experience of Tibet. In spite of the contrasting and often jarring experiences, I found Tibet to be a place that brought me back to my center. Tibet is where I learned to live with my light and dark, my turmoil and tranquility, my yin and yang. Tibet was truly an experience of a lifetime. This is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple, the philosophy is kindness. <laughs>